familiar. You're familiar. How are you? Thanks hi, for joining. You? Hi, Ron. Hi, George. Uh, and hi, audience. Uh, it's two o'clock on a Monday and we are joined today. I'm excited for this guest. I'm excited for this guest because, um, in my opinion, he is going to talk to us about how America is going to recover uh, post-pandemic. His name is Ron Laurier and uh, he is a longtime Staten Islander and a uh, worker for, uh, I'm sorry, and a representative for uh, Local 28 Sheet Metal uh, Union. And he's been in this Sheet Metal Workers Union for a very long time. He's speaking to us as a private citizen, but he's going to give us our perspective on why unions are so important um, to America and to the recovery of America and to business. Uh, you know, Ron has been around, if anybody's been on Facebook, Ron, uh, or uh, rather newspapers, Ron is very active in local politics. And we're coming to you from Staten Island, New York, which is part of New York City, for those of you that are from the um, greater world area. And Ron has been uh, really active in not only politics, but issues that are important to New York um, and, and more importantly, issues that are important to workers. And while the, com the government is shut down and businesses shut down and everybody is talking about going back to work and how to do it safely, we thought it would be a great idea to have Ron on the show to talk about issues facing employees, especially employees in the construction trade and manufacturing and nurses and uh, so so many other uh, organized uh, laborers. So without further ado, I am happy to uh, say hello to Ron Loria. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you, George. Thank you, Leticia, for having me. I think things like this are great. I think it's a public service and uh, I appreciate it. It's nice yeah. to, I like to see human beings uh, that, that are different too, and <laughs> missing that. I agree. So, I agree. Ron, uh, as Leticia mentioned, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I know this a little. I am a, uh, I'm a member of Local 28 Sheet Metal Workers for 26 years. I uh, I do not officially represent Local 28 in, in that capacity, or politically or otherwise, but I'm speaking on behalf of the labor movement and, in particular, the construction unions as a private citizen. I've been involved in union politics, as Leticia mentioned, and uh, public politics and land use issues and other things on Staten Island. Uh, there is a stigma attached to unions. You know, people think everything is bloated, overpriced, lazy, lazy workers. Just to give you a little background in particular on the building trades unions of New York City, we have about 100,000 members and uh, we are competitive against each other. So it's very capitalist in nature in that. We're not just a group of people who get assigned to a job site and when it's done, it's done. There is a very competitive nature in the construction industry and each worker sort of works individually to promote himself to be the biggest and the best uh, trained worker for that company. Uh, also, the construction unions have well over a thousand affiliated companies that are all categorized as small business. And 70% of America is employed by small business. These are men and women who went through the apprenticeship programs like I did and put their houses up and got together with a few other members and opened up uh, an electrical company, a sheet metal company, a carpenter company. And through the opening of those companies and that entrepreneurial spirit, we have 100,000 members. Uh, we train very hard. We train... Uh, Underneath people with years and years of experience, we get classroom time on top of that. In the past approximately four years, there's been about 60 fatalities on New York City construction sites. Over 90% of them have been on non-union sites. That's, that's a tragic number, and it is because of the lack of training. Uh, we, have, uh, we also invest in the market through our annuities, our 401ks. Our, uh, our pension plans, we invest heavily in the market to the tune of tens of billions 
a year. So you have more of that capitalist nature regarding that. And I also think something that uh, very few people know, the building trades take part in the Helmets to Hard Hats program. Tens of thousands of veterans have been, have been brought into our apprenticeship programs and now have a middle-class career in a professional industry where they can buy a home and have a family. Veterans, it's very sad, very unfortunate. They suffer a much higher rate of unemployment than the general public in America. And as sad as that is, I have something very tragic to tell you. They suffer up to eight times the rate of suicide. Yeah. When you become a member of a union, yeah. you have better medical coverage and resources, unfortunately, than the VA has to offer. Yeah, I think Scott Labedo just... To it, I'm sorry. Just to go to your point, Scott Labido recently um, let us all know that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. I mean, 22 yes. a day. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. No, that, that, that's an incredibly, it's a tragic number. And to me, I have a brother who's a veteran and, you know, and he has a PTSD. And that's what leads to other issues, which in turn does lead to suicide. Uh, having better medical coverage, being part of what we refer to as a brotherhood and a sisterhood, you, we have networks within the unions where we have meetings, groups of veterans. We have the Emerald Society and things like that. We have dinners where we have we put together scholarship funds so members' children and grandchildren can go to college. So we're, we're involved in a community after September 11th, after Hurricane Sandy, the building trades were all over Staten Island. They were up and down Highland Boulevard helping people with clothes, water, putting their homes back together, donating money. And uh, so that's just, that's just a quick background. With the Helmets to Hard Hats program, we invest in the market. We are competitive. And it sort of bothers me when the word socialism gets injected into unionism because we are very much a part of the small business community, the, the consumer industry, we're, uh, we're very part, you know, involved in the, uh, like I mentioned, in the community, investing in the market. So we don't have that socialist type of thing that, that people refer to. That's just part of the stigma. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a big uh, stigma. Uh, I see, I'm sorry. There's a, there is, there's a huge yeah. stigma That's attached to unions. I, and I think it's more about the fact that people don't understand them and, and they don't understand what a union is there to do. I, I think the, you know, look, my grandfather, yes. both my grandfathers were longshoremen. So they uh, they were very active in their unions and they were very active in keeping the, at the time it was mostly men on the docks um, protected. And because at the time, you know, in yes. the sixties, you know, there were some dangerous situations occurring uh, on the docks in New York and all around the country. As a matter of fact, my husband's uncle was actually killed unloading uh, a boat on the dock. He actually got killed by something, you know, dropped by a crane. And, um, Later on, my father was in construction and he was in Florida, which is a right to work state. And uh, he was telling me stories that, you know, some of these concrete slabs that they used to build, that one day they really it toppled over and killed a man on the job. And instead of sending everybody home and reassessing, they just... Uh, they just moved everything out of the way and continued to work. So unions have, have played an active role in keeping people safe. And as a Republican, which I am, um, people could not, you know, always question me on, well, how, how, how is it you support unions? And my answer has always been, well, first of all, I come from a union family. Second off, in my experience, unions, um, for safer work sites, which saves time on the job site and money for for on the job. And at the end of the day, if we're in a capitalist nation, isn't that what we're seeking? We're seeking an efficient, safe workplace at, at the best cost possible. I'm sorry, George. And a smaller government, right? So we don't, you know, if the unions step away, the government's going to have to step in, right? That's just the way it is. That's what they're trying to do now. We, you know, as a Republican, I can say clearly, I don't want more government involvement. I'd rather leave, leave it to the hands of the people. Yeah. That's a good point, George, because, you know, the truth yes, is, is uh, that, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Like said, the, on Staten Island in particular, we have the highest percentage of union members of all the five boroughs. Uh, we have the highest rate of home ownership. We are the middle class community. And still you get that anti-union sentiment to, to some degree 
And uh, a lot of Republicans are actually endorsed by unions, while Democrats usually are, they usually are more together, on, you know, on the same boat when it comes to issues and things. But, uh, a lot, I mean, I'll tell you what, uh, you show me a Republican candidate in New York City who has not taken money from a union. Yeah. I'm pretty sure just about everyone has at one point or another. And uh, back to the safety <laughs> issue, it really, when, when someone dies on a, on a New York City construction site, it ends up costing the taxpayers millions of dollars. Uh, the, the work gets shut down. People get sent home. There has to be investigations. There's lawsuits. There's a lot of litigation. And that comes up into the tens of millions of dollars that it costs to the taxpayer. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, a few years ago, and unfortunately the city council passed a bill, uh, the Construction Safety Bill 1447 C, the original version, 1447A, which was popular in the city council when it was first introduced, promoted building trades, apprenticeship programs, which I'll go into, on larger, a certain size and certain dynamic of construction sites in New York City. And it was due to this tragic rate of fatalities on construction sites. That bill got watered down to 1447C, which means pretty much non-union workers who don't go through an extensive educational process, that is our apprenticeship program, take online courses or 30 or 40 hours of uh, classroom time. And that seems to, in the government's eyes, or at least the mayor's eyes, that makes them equal to my four-year apprenticeship with hundreds of hours of classroom time, on-site training, OSHA credentials, etc. So there really is no comparison. And you're right, a, a safer job site, it's, it's leaner, it gets done quicker, it's more efficient, it's more cost effective. And you have a workforce that is made up uh, of a certain percentage of veterans by policy, invest in the market. Again, I, I bring things like that up because people don't realize the benefit of having a well-trained workforce in New York City, especially with the complexities of construction that we have here. The yeah. greatest city in the world should be built with the greatest, best trained workforce available. And that is the building trades of New York City. So let's talk a little bit about that. OK. And um, when I was chair of Community Board One, I, I, I took the unprecedented move of creating the first labor committee in all of New York City for the Community Board. And I did that because. Yes. yes. I did it because we had a, some great projects coming up on the waterfront, right? At the time it was Irby, it was um, the New York Wheel, it was Empire Outlets, uh, Lighthouse Points. And in my opinion, if we were going to get those projects in the ground and completed in a safe and timely and cost-effective fashion, we had to have labor that was trained to do the job, right? And and we asked that that we have apprenticeship programs and that we, wherever possible, were able to have the men and women that lived on Staten Island and belonged to, to labor and the construction to, to be a part of it. We also asked for minority and woman-owned businesses um, you know, on Staten Island to be a part of that. And, you know, if, the, if there were people or small businesses that were not union, that a, a deal be made with those businesses to work together on the job site with the union. And I, I have to tell you something, I'm proud of that. And that committee still lives. And as a matter of fact, um, the current chairman of Community Board One in Staten Island is a member of Local 3. Um, and so I'm really proud of that because we set a precedent. And I don't know that any other community board has you know, adopted that. But the reason I bring it up is um, because going forward, right, we just heard the class of 2020 that they're graduating. And uh, in the days before the, the there was a big uh, a commencement address, and I think that, that uh, it was on Fox, it was on a couple of new channels, that all these people got together to address, um, you know, class of 2020. And a couple of days before that, we heard that California was talking about maybe not even having college uh, sessions in full. So the people, the young people who graduated in 2020 are, are faced with a lot of choices in front of them, right? Because the post-COVID world is different. And 
I think it would be really important for you, Ron, to take this opportunity now, whether they're watching or not, maybe they'll watch later on, to talk to young people about the opportunities in the apprenticeship programs that unions offer um, so that they have another alternative because their mindset might have been college, 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 and just college. But the new world is likely going to be where construction industry, which I just want to I just want to brag for a second and, and stop me when, when, when you've had enough but the construction industry in New York was number fourth in the nation in 2018 for uh, as an economic driver. And it was actually, it, it, construction was number three in New York um, City as an economic driver. What came before that was retail and consulting. Now we know that those two industries, retail especially, is going to move to online and consulting will likely be mostly online, which means that New York will probably, their first economic driver in 2020, 20 will probably be construction. So the jobs will likely be there for construction if the, the state uh, and, and the city work together with the union. So Ronnie, why don't you tell people how they could get involved in apprenticeship programs and, and what the unions do for young people? Well, there's, there's about 15 major unions within the building trades of New York City. Uh, it's it, every so often they'll publicly announce that they're going to take applications. You can go online and find out. It's easy enough to Google. Uh, we participate in jobs fairs throughout the city in conjunction with members of the city council and community boards, uh, the principals of high schools, because it does offer their, their students a future. Uh, the apprenticeship programs are that we have, a, we're part of a New York State accredited apprenticeship program which is separate when, from what we call a rogue union, that they come up with these different programs and they graduate one or two people a year. There's really, it's, there's no comparison to what we do as far as our educational system within the trades. So there, there definitely is a future in construction in Manhattan. Uh, but you're right, in the post-COVID world, we don't know what retail space is going to look like. We don't know uh, how many people are going to reoccupy offices, but uh, there's still a tremendous amount of residential, high-rise construction, new school construction, the MTA tunnels. We have a lot of infrastructure work going on. So I don't see a slowdown anytime uh, in the very near future, but it does go in peaks and valleys, and it really does depend on whether New York City and New York State hold up to their obligations to the people of New York City to continue developing. One of the first things the mayor did a few months ago was he pulled back funding from projects that were in the design phase. In other words, they're just being drawn up. So he pulled funding away. What that tells me, being in my industry for so long, is that a few years down the road, those are projects that are not going to happen. Yeah. And that's people that are going to be out of work. So, you know, it, it, the construction industry has a ripple effect. It keeps other people employed. When you earn a decent living, you, you spend more money, you become more of uh, our consumer-driven economy. Uh, but when the mayor and possibly the governor do hold back funding, and listen, the, the, the budget is being reviewed right now for New York City. It's got to be done by, I think, June 1st. Uh, if they hold back on projects like Sunnyside Yards or other projects that are crucial to the growing city from a business and residence point of view, that's going to be a disservice to the people. Because to get moving... After we get the economy going again, it's going to take people working, paying yeah. taxes, you know, generating revenue for the city, state, and federal coffers. We can't be, it's crazy to think that we can continue on this road, the, what we're doing, which is a lot with those rallies we were about yesterday. And you have one side that really wants to open up business and get going. And uh, I don't even call it restarting the economy. I call it reigniting the economy. Because you really want to get that spark going, get people out there back to work and spending. And the other side uh, is very cautious, sometimes too cautious. The way I look at it, and you two are very familiar with business, what business would reopen and not do so safely? Why would they even <laughs> risk the liabilities? Why would they risk being shut down? Why would they risk the penalties and fines yeah. from New York City? These people are family people like the thousands of construction companies in the city, restaurant owners, bagel store, delis, uh, bar owners, and so on, that we know so many of personally, 
They put their houses up. They open businesses. They're going to protect it. They're there to make money. They're not there to jeopardize it and cut corners. That they're there. So if they're there to make money, how foolish would it be to think that they would risk it by not following the protocols set forth by government? I know the yeah. construction industry is way ahead of the curve with this. The building and construction trades have met with the Real Estate Board of New York and other people to set standards for construction sites. And I read it. It's good. And it's, it's, we're, we're going to have safe operating conditions when the construction industry comes back full force. Yeah, it seems Small to businesses, me, for the reasons, I'm sorry? I was going to say, it seems to me like they don't trust us to be responsible. And, and I blame the media for some of that, you know, because they're going to put the one nutball that's licking doorknobs on the news. But the reality is dude, we're just, we need to be trusted that we can do this safely. I don't want my grandmother to die. I don't want your grandmother yeah. to die. Um, you know, we're going to take those right. precautions and, you know, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so I think, you know, you hit a good point. Yeah. There. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. I, it scares me a little bit that the government has that little, that little, That's little, what little I, trust in us. Go ahead, Ron. Yes. I, I, I find that the one extreme on the other is to open up immediately and, Obviously, the one extreme on the other is to you know, hold back as long as possible, and they're all for these multi-trillion dollar stimulus, which are necessary to a degree, but not right. perpetual or sustainable. That's just common sense. On the one hand, with the opening everything up very quickly, the largest economy in the world, the largest economy centralized in New York City in the United States, which is the largest economy in the world, is not a light switch. You can't turn it on and have hundreds of thousands, possibly a million or more people getting onto mass transit, which I think is a very big issue. Yeah, oh, you know, huge. Packed subway cars, packed. I mean, that's that's a major issue. That is right up there with, with schools and putting 32 kids in the classroom. That's so right. that has to be addressed, and that's not flicking a light switch either. So it, things are going to have to be addressed. And after everything this city and this country has been through in the past few months, it's really just a matter of weeks of setting things uh, in order, getting things in order and organized to do it the safest way possible. Yes, it's government. It may take a little longer, but I do, uh, I do have confidence it's going to go a little quicker than, than people think. And I think things will get back to normal and people will sort of crawl out of this. And small business is the driving en engine. You know, it's not so much finance, the market, a lot of people working from home. It's the small business that employs the people. It's the small business that are the homeowners in communities like Staten Island. And so we yeah. do have to get back to work, but we have to find that middle ground where we know every industry, whether it be construction, whether it be finance, whether it be retail or restaurants, that we have the protocol and parameters set to follow and which, like we discussed and agree on, that the, it's in their interest to follow. I do put confidence in the business community of this city and country to do what is right. I fear uh, lackings with opening the schools and mass transportation. That's going to be difficult issues to overcome, but it doesn't mean we hold back. It doesn't mean we don't move forward. Sometimes one step at a time, sometimes we'll take leaps. But the American spirit historically has proven that we will prevail and we will do it. And through every tragic episode, war, depression in this country, we've always come out better. That's a fact. We always come the out people better. of this country, the people of the city, to do just that. Yeah, I, I'm confident we will. And I think government might be holding us back, but we sort of have to meet in the middle. Do yeah. it, do it right, but for damn sure, do it. So, Ron, I want to stop you for a minute because we've been remiss in doing this in the past. We've had some um, viewers that have been on with us that we want to acknowledge. Lucille Chavon has joined us. Connie Celia Reginella Baron has joined us. Bonnie Standard. Cookie Balage uh, has joined us. And my mom, Josephine Nastasi, who hasn't yet missed a show, has joined us today. So hello to everybody. Um, my mom, Ronnie, uh, you know, wants to, to ask you or to ask the public, um, you, uh, you know, how do bu business owners feel about their employees joining a union? Uh, I think that, Ron, you and I spoke a little bit about at the top, you know, before we came on air, uh, 
about some business owners when they hear that their their employees are organizing that they they become very worried or concerned that somehow or another um, it's going to cost them more money or too much money or um, it's just going to be a detriment to them. And I I think that you when you talked about the fact that unions are you know competitive and also small business owners uh, themselves. Uh, that should have answered the question, but but maybe um, why don't you tell me what would you say you know to a to a business owner who was in the construction trades and uh, you know they learned that somebody was trying to organize their shop. Okay. When it comes to a, a business uh, being organized or people trying to you know, workers trying to organize within that business, it's very industry sensitive. If it's a restaurant, it's one totally different set of rules and circumstances. In the construction industry in, in particular, especially in New York City, uh, we, we provide a labor pool. A company in my union who normally employs 10 people can take a job, get in touch with the union, go through the hiring hall, and get 30 or 40 qualified, trained people in a day or two so he can man that job. So these companies, these small companies, can bid on more work and then more company the more companies that bid the more competition you have which drives the price down but you still have the best labor force on site regardless with other industries manufacturing uh it, it really should be unionized because it has a large uh, a labor pool it, it involves work and shift work there's dangers involved and like i mentioned before a, a, it's like a fair day's work for a fair day's pay if people make a decent living that is part of a, the revolving economy. So in manufacturing, say they have 100 people working and making whatever, to ha have them not unionize, you know, you, you really, it's not as dependable of a workforce. Uh, they're not going to have health coverage. You don't know what's going to happen. If they get sick, they, uh, and they, uh, a manufacturer might want to increase the volume of what he's doing or expand. He'll have that union to go to for that, uh, that, that certified and trained uh, workforce, that labor pool. Again, it's very uh, industry sensitive. Like for a re you really don't see it. Honestly, let's, I mean, how many restaurants do you know that are unionized or like bagel stores or something like that? So it really doesn't affect mom and pop family owned businesses that we're all familiar with on Staten Island. But the larger the industry, the more need there is for a trained workforce. Uh, and you have a lot of non union companies, whether it be construction or not. And Diane Savino has been really big on this, on uh, a wage debt, paying off the books, taking kickbacks from workers on top of unsafe conditions. Yeah. And that, when workers don't pay, th think about this, X amount of workers are not paying city, state, and federal tax, and we all know there's a lot of them. Yeah. That, we have to make up for that in the budget. The taxpayers make up. If the New York City budget, for example, is $90 billion, and X amount, amount of people are not contributing X amount of money, that has got to come from someplace. That's going to come from me and Leticia and George and our families who work and pay our taxes. Yep. So those companies are reaping the rewards, right? They're exploiting a workforce. It's tax evasion, which, I mean, let's face it, we all know somebody pretty well who went to jail for that. Yes, sir. Sure. It runs rampant in certain industries where it should not be. So, Ron, now, on, that, to, that, that was to not that. a shot at him, by the way. Yeah, that, yeah, that no. Was not a shot at him. We're talking a small restaurant and doing something minimal that was not a shot at him whatsoever that that was to say that uh in larger scale industries like manufacturing and uh and construction where uh working off the books and tax evasion and wage theft is more prevalent that's where a large a large uh, amount of revenue is not going in to the government and like i mentioned before those are the industries where people get hurt yeah. So, and Ronnie, and worse money, than that, how do they subsidize it? Worse than that, I think that now, right to your point about people paying people off the books, it, it, we know that it happens in the restaurant industry, and the second culprit is the construction industry. Now, let's just think about what's occurring right now for the moment. And I've been running around saying this over and over and over again. If you were a contractor and you had your guys and gals working off the book, books right now those men and women cannot get unemployment 
they right they they're not eligible for unemployment but what even worse is, or not even worse is now that that person that business that decided that that was the way to go by skirting taxes that person doesn't have records of employment to get ppp loans so they are like last in the program to be able to get anything and unemployment is really the the state unemployment um for anybody that's a uh, self-employed will tell you that they've tried to apply for it and they uh, unemployment is making it almost impossible for them to get um you know any kinds of loans or assistance so in essence what i'm trying to say is for all those years that those people were you know, stealing from everyone because that's what they were doing, right? Stealing from everyone. Um, yes. Now it's come back to bite them in the ass, and in the worst possible time, you know, po you know, ever. And and I doubt that they have had enough savings in their accounts to be able to survive uh, for the next couple of months. Uh, so anyway, I just uh, I guess I guess karma's a but a bitch. And there you go. Right. So, uh, and for those of you who uh, recognize that we have a little bit of a delay, Ronnie is, is a little bit delayed. So if it looks like we're talking over each other, it's not because we're trying to be rude. He's a little delayed. <laughs> uh, but Ronnie, I want to just go back for a minute. And George, do you have that clip ready? Yeah, I can play it. Okay. So, so over uh, Friday, there was a group that were protesting in Albany and uh, they wanted to go back to work. And then I was part of a group on Saturday uh, that protested in Staten Island. There was a second group, CW, uh, the local, uh, I think it's 1102. Uh, it was communication workers. At any rate, uh, the governor responded to a reporter's question at Friday's press conference or Thursday, Saturday's press conference where the reporter asked about businesses that wanted to go back to work. And uh, the governor said this, George has the clip. So if, if George will play it, everybody could see what the governor said. I get Everybody gets it. Everybody feels it. You want to go to work? Go take the job as an essential worker. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, so what the governor was saying there is, you know, mm -hmm. small business who were demonstrating frustration that they couldn't go back to work. The governor said, you know, in his very sometimes condescending tone, oh, go take a job as an essential worker. The reason I wanted people to see that clip is because, you know, if we're going to recover our economy, we have to face some facts, right? Some of the facts are that we were $8 billion in the hole when, before COVID hit. Okay, that's fact one. Fact two is the construction industry, we talked about it already, was number three as, a, a, as an economic driver in New York City and fourth nationwide for New York's uh, construction industry, was number four nationwide in employing people. It, just in New York City alone, um, it, it, half a million people were employed at an average salary of $80,000 a year. And I don't care where you live, $80,000 is a pretty good is a pretty good number for employment. So, so the in New York, just the southern region, the, the New York City region, thirty-two billion dollars was generated by the construction industry in twenty eighteen. Okay, that's not counting nineteen. This was a. It, don't believe me, folks. Look it up. Um, Thomas Dinopoli, our controller, released the report. You can find it online. And uh, so, so for me. It would. I would have liked to see the governor say something like, you know what, here's our plan. Our plan is this. Uh, we're going to phase in, you know, getting back to work. The people that are trained to work and, and who have to work safe, like, oh, I don't know, the construction industry who has to wear PPE and has to have OSHA training. And we all know that the trades don't work on top of each other, right? Electricians don't work in the same space as plumbers. You know, uh, glacers don't work in the same place as electricians. They keep each other safe. They keep the work site safe. They keep each other safe. Why in the hell wouldn't the governor, instead of being so flippant and um, and being so, you know, just 
nasty like he was. So why wouldn't he say, look, we have a plan and here's our plan. Instead, we have these interesting uh, mile markers, if you were milestones. If you're working on a 20-story affordable housing job in Manhattan, you're allowed to work. But you're, if you're if you are working on a commercial center in Manhattan, you're not allowed to work. If you're working on a house that you started a bathroom and the poor family has been peeing in a bucket for the last freaking you know nine weeks, you can't install the bathroom. You so you know, if you if you're mowing a lawn, you can mow the lawn, but you can't install the new lawn and the new garden that you put together for your newly remodeled house. So. <laughs> Ronnie, give me your take on this. Um, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, it, it's politicians that make the decisions, whether it be Washington, Albany, or City Hall. But it's we, the people, the workers. We're the ones that make the sacrifice. We're the ones that go out there and go out there every day. We're the ones who do the work. We're the ones who comply with the rules. It's easy. They all work hard. Some are better than others, but it's, we're the ones that have to walk the walk, okay? And when it comes to the different uh, decisions with the construction industry, one of the mayor's biggest campaign promises or dreams when he first got elected was well over 100,000 units of affordable housing. When there's a pandemic drowning our city, he says it's okay for workers to take man transportation and work in that industry which is statistically the most inherently dangerous business in this city right now. Yeah. But it's okay to do the affordable housing. Uh, there are new schools. I was scheduled to work at a new school on Staten Island. There are new schools where they stop construction, where we desperately need, now more than ever, we need more school seats so there's less kids in a classroom for obvious reasons. They stopped that, or much of that or all of that, but affordable housing continues. I, I find that uh, I, I'll be polite and say it's ironic, but uh, I, I find it politically motivated, and it's 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 wrong it's wrong on so many levels, and uh, you know you get like I'll I'll single the mayor out. I'm speaking as a private citizen. He's very good at taking credit for things that even remotely go right in in his arena. You mean those very two things? Those two finger. things? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the right stuff. <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> Very quick to, to point the fingers. Yeah. You know, when he ran for office, he was very pro union. You know, he it was the rah rah worker of the world speech and everything. And then he wouldn't, he refused to pass legislation that not only would promote the union safe working professional agenda, it would have statistically saved lives. Now they could say maybe, maybe or not. You know, you can't prove that. Statistically, yeah, I can't prove it because well over 90% of the fatalities are non union sites. That's right. There's 20, 30, or 40% more of the construction market share was union. Statistically, there would be people, fathers. Uh, coincidentally, it was all men that died of that approximately five dozen in the past four years. One of them was an Air Force veteran. Uh, he died because it's hard to explain. It's a little piece of linkage on a harness. That cost a couple of dollars. He died because of that. He fell to his death. He fought two tours overseas in the Air Force. There are people with children. There are who are, these kids are now orphans. Now, when those people work for companies like that and they die, their families don't have a lot of options. Now you have more families on public assistance. When workers don't get paid a fair wage, like we've seen with uh, other large corporations, they subsidize their income with public assistance. So it all sort of ties into each other. And I know I went a little off because you were talking about the governor and the mayor. Yeah, that's all right. It really does no, tie no, into no, each no, other, no, but no. the bottom line is you're right. It all ties but, together. But, but the one thing that I, I didn't bring yes. up, and I, should, I guess I thought it was, you know, people would know it, but I think I should make it clear, is those affordable housing jobs, the majority of them, I, am I wrong in, in stating that the mayor said, sorry, it can't be union because it's, afford, it's, it's affordable housing and there's not enough, um, you know, break-even money. And so it's instead... Um, uh, oh God, I can't remember uh, what they call uh, the wage, um, uh, prevailing wage. Prevailing job. wage. Prevailing wage. Yeah. So, so the one, the one 
the entities that are allowed to work right now, the people working on the entities right now are the non-union jobs. I mean, look, and I don't, I don't be, you know, I don't say that they shouldn't be working, but you know, I look, I know that the mayor has kicked you guys in the head over and over and over again. And, um, and you know, this is just one of them, in my opinion, when he says we can't do an affordable housing job union because it's going to cost too much money. What that does is it drives the perception that unions add money money to the jobs instead of unions saving money to the jobs. And I know a little bit about that perception because when I was in the Battery Park City Authority, we created the first green buildings ever in New York. And the first thing that every developer said when we said you have to build green was, oh, it's going to cost too much money. You're adding all this, uh, you know, on the price. We can't do it. We can't do it. And so we demonstrated why it would save the money in the long run just in the, you you know, maybe the materials because they weren't readily available at the time were maybe at a premium cost, but the maintenance of the building over time was going to pay back that cost. And the health mm -hmm. of the people living in the building uh, was so paramount and important to them that they were willing to pay a premium in rent to have their kids living in a green and healthier environment. And so the Battery Park City Authority became the cutting edge on that. And guess who was by our sides while we were doing it? The unions, you know, the unions, because interestingly enough, you know, for photovoltaics, it would normally be uh, the job for the Glaciers Union, but because you had to hook up you know, for the electricity, it was also a cross trades. And um, they were, they worked with us on that to make sure that we were able to build that building and the solar was the first one at any rate. So that, so that just furthers your point that unions are, you know, are, are competitive and also like small business owners, they understand, you know, what the economy looks like. So I just wanted to bring yes. that up. If you guys don't mind, I'd like to transition, transition into something. I want to show you a clip from a guy called Mike Rowe, uh, dirt, the guy who used to host Dirty Jobs. One of the things that, and I'm just talking about trades, and I, I know we're going off on, on another topic here, but how, you know, do you need to go to college, and what's the better job for the future of America? I, I want to show you guys this clip because I find this guy fascinating, and I hold the same position as him. Let me bring him up on screen a second, then we can get, I'd like to get your opinion on what he said. We're getting really fancy here. We, we... Wait, maybe I should turn the volume on. <laughs> oh, Education, in my view, is not anything that you can get by without. But the kind of education. I get a lot of heat because I take the position about education that a lot of people uh, misinterpret to mean don't go to college. And I would never say don't go to college unless you can't afford it or if you're not sure why you're going. There's been a push in this country for the last 40 years or so, this suggestion that a four-year degree is the best path for the most people. I don't believe that's true. On my last gig, I met a lot of people who didn't go to college who were, in fact, very smart and very driven uh, and very talented and who prospered. But they were also educated, just not in a traditional way. So I think what's really important today is to um, make sure that you talk about the value of a skilled trade in the same way that you talk about the value of academic uh, success. Here's the platitude. If you don't get educated, you're through. That's very, very different than saying if you don't get a four-year degree, you, you have no hope. And that's... That's basically what we've been saying for a long time. Yeah, I find with that statement powerful. I think it's part of our recovery for this country. And we 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 don't give enough credit to the tradespeople and the trades the trade workers. Uh, we hold up office workers and we we say, oh, he got that job at the construction site. There needs to be a marketing change here somewhere. Somebody needs to make this the new sexy. You know, and yeah. I think, you know, we can start it here today with us three. What do you think? Making making trades the new sexy, making trades something that you don't look, you know, years ago people looked down on. I think more and more now they're not. But I'd love to hear your opinion on that, Ron, making trades something that, you know, you if you don't go to college, that doesn't matter. You're still going to get an education. 
and talk about maybe about the education in the trade. The, the, I'll, you, you. Go ahead, Ron. You, 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 you broke up a little bit, but I'm going to answer it best I can from, from what I got. So correct me if, uh, if, if I'm off course here. Sure. Uh, you're talking about the apprenticeship programs and the level of education? Yeah. Like trade schools and, and well, how okay. be, they should be the, the, the trade, they should be well, as the, a, the, the trade school is one thing. The delay is killing me. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry Ron. A, a, a trade school is. So, Ronnie, what uh, I, uh, again, I, the, I think the, that what the, we're the, trying the, to do the, here is to um, have your commentary on the future of America. You know, that battle. Should, do, should you. Should you only go to college or can you choose a profession in the trades oh. and get as, uh, you know, and have okay. a good future? And I, we, we were we were planning to talk about that anyway, because especially now, since I think people are concerned about so many, much of our goods being made in China and they don't want that anymore. Yes. Right. So this cl graduating class of not only 2020, but 2021, 22, 23, they, you know, we need to change the mindset of, you know, just go to go get your degree and go get a job, you know, in a, in a white collar kind of uh, business. But to say, you know, it's okay to work with your hands. Not only is it okay, but it's, it is embraced and you will be doing more, um, you know, or as much to help your country if you work with your hands as if you go and you get an education for a white collar job. So, Ronnie, you take it away. OK, uh, it, it's really up to the individual, but uh, the opportunity for manufacturing and construction jobs, in my opinion, will grow. Like I said, it goes in peaks and valleys. But I think uh, with the big in a big picture point of view, the industry will grow. And you can make a, a good, decent living out of it. Uh, as far as the training goes, our apprenticeship programs offer classroom time. Most of our apprenticeship programs can be applied toward a degree in college. In my union and many, and many other construction trade unions, you have mechanical draftsmen who work on com with computers. They work with engineers and architects you know, uh, to actually build uh, mechanical systems and other uh, uh, engineering geared type of work, uh, which is not the hands-on construction aspect of it. There are people who do estimating. So there's a whole comprehensive industry that varies from trade to trade. But there are good employment opportunities. It's not too often you can get a job in the city where you can invest in a 401k, an annuity, and or a pension at the same time while earning a decent living. And make no mistake about it. You have to really know this is what you want to do. It's you freeze in the winter. It's very hot in the summer. It is dangerous no matter how safe you work. It's not the easiest task in the world. Uh, when I talk to guys about retiring, everyone doesn't say how many years they have left. They say how many winters they have left. Yeah. Because it, it, it takes a toll. It's brutal. It's dangerous. It takes years of training to do the right way. So you should get paid a, a, a fair day's pay. It, it is very justified and it's what the market can bear. And so there, there, are, there are job opportunities uh, in, in conjunction with college and furthering uh, your education. And like you mentioned, with the whole manufacturing issue with China, uh, I think China taking a sort of bad route internationally. I think America is going to address our manufacturing process and, and, and stop all this importing and dealing with all this uh, unemployment and people living paycheck by paycheck. We can have more gainful employment as opposed to going week by week. There's something very interesting. Again, it ties together in a way. Uh, in 2008, when they had the stimulus plan, between $600 and $1,200 was mailed out. It was to a lesser degree than this. The 90% of the people spent it on durable goods. They were buying cars, all going on vacation, things of that nature. There was a study by Columbia University and Northwestern University. People who received their stimulus check 2020 as of April 21st, most of them used it to pay their mortgage, rent, and buy food. So it shows you a different dynamic of where our economy is. You know, it really is based on gainful employment and quality of life. And unions do contribute to those areas. So I think it is critical to have that fairly paid workforce. I think it is very important that people make a decision in high school, college, to go into different, to look into different areas. There's a, a whole world out there and construction, manufacturing, 
is is part of it. It's more in depth than what you see at face value. If I could ask a follow up, you know, to to that, uh, what the, from today I decide I want to be I, I want to be an electrician. What's and I, I know we didn't you know pre do this question, so I don't. If you don't have the answer, it's okay. How much am I looking at to go from apprentice to journeyman in my career versus college? And, and I guess the point I'm trying to make with that is financially, I think you're fiscally smarter if you don't burn that three or four hundred thousand dollars on college because in the in the trades industry you get to earn while you learn. Is that right? Am I, you know, if I'm off base, shoot me down. I'm not. Yes. Back. Yes. Uh, uh, we, when it, every union is different. When you come into the construction trades, you go through an apprenticeship. You start off. I, it depends. It depends on the union. Approximately 25, 28 percent, something like that, of the full scale, and you get a raise either every year or every six months. That's basically. Like I said, every union is different. But if you start off as a police officer, a fireman, a school teacher, or even in finance, you're starting off at some level. Very, very few people walk out of Harvard into that quarter million dollar a year job, and God bless them, uh, more power to them. But in the real world, everyone starts out of high school or college at a certain level, and you work your way up. In any industry, you have to work hard and prove yourself to earn that, that better pay, to get that promotion. So it's pretty much the same in in this industry, in the construction industry. So if, if, my, if I could go back since we're discussing the, the sure, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say in my experience, okay, well, uh, we <laughs> I did a delay. Okay, in my experience, uh, I have I have seen <laughs> people who have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of college debt um, because. They decided, you know, the, to go to school to be, I don't know, for technology or for whatever else um, and now now be unemployed or, or come out of college without a job to go to. And so they wound up being a waitress or a bartender or a barista, while some of the young people who took the course of becoming an apprentice in a union who might have started at maybe 30,000, which again, you know, in New York, it's low, but still for entering in and learning, you know, about a trade, not so bad, who within five years were making 80 and $90,000 more with overtime. Uh, and that person, that other person who went to college still doesn't have a job that is, is paying enough to pay the bills. And the other thing I want to say uh, with respect to you know, unions and, and trades, I find it amazing that when, um, when de Blasio decided to create these trade high schools, that the majority of those trade high schools were for uh, careers in like graphic design or set uh, creation for, you know, theater or, um, you know, technology. But we in New York City depend on unions and people who work uh, with their hands or do physical and manual labor to run our city. Why didn't we have schools that would train people, high schools that would train young people how to drive a bus or, you know, drive a train or, you know, be a janitor in a school or, or a city building or, you know, there, there's so many services, um, you know, social workers, I mean, it's so many services. Oh, well, social, I get workers is more of a white collar, but we have so many blue collar services in New York City that we are dependent upon as a, a city. Why weren't we telling young people hey, you can learn about these. And by virtue of providing them the opportunity to see or learn about those jobs, taking away any negative stigma that might be attached to working with your hands. I don't know about you, but when you ask, when I ask young parents what, you know, what they hope their child's going to be when they grow up, very few of them say, I hope my child studies janitorial services and becomes a <laughs> 
But if you yeah. talk to any school custodian, you know that some of those custodians are drawing down six figure salaries. Most of them are drawing down six figure yeah. salaries. So what the hell is the matter with the parents? that they don't recognize that a good hard day's work and yes maybe a profession is a little bit dangerous but you know what everything can be dangerous walking out your door can be dangerous hey there was a virus that was going around that's killing hundreds of thousands of people in, in america that nobody saw coming and nobody could do anything about that's dangerous so why wouldn't you as a parent say let me give my kid a shot and in the in the next breath and ronnie i'll let you jump in in a second and the next breath is, then I run across a bunch of parents that have kids that go, try and get to be a city worker. Get in the union. Get in the union. Do whatever you can. Get in yeah. the union. And you know what? They're right. And, and you as a parent, I think we as parents have an obligation to recognize, are our kids college materials or not? Because not every kid is cut out for college. And as parents, for us to try and shove that kid along by saying, oh, little Johnny or Joni is not a good test taker. So your Johnny or Joni has an ADD or CFB or ABCDEFG and needs medication. I make excuses for the kid all the way through not only grade school and high school, but also through college. We are doing that kid a disservice and we're not you know, being the best for, you know, for as, as parents. We need to recognize some kids are going to be better off with their hands and let them follow their their dream and give them the opportunity. Open the door to blue collar work. And so go ahead, Ronnie. I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> Never enough. Uh, there's, uh, there's more student debt in America than credit card debt. I'm okay. sure we all know people who get out of college and whether they have a job or not, they have a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they haven't even earned a paycheck yet. What should be done, as you mentioned before, in high school, opportunities should be shown to students. When I was sixteen or seventeen, no one said, you know, there's a vast array of industries you can get into, from finance to medicine to construction. You could join the military. You could get involved. You know, there's so many different avenues that a teenager, a high school student could look into. They're not really shown that. They take the advice of their parents. They see where their older siblings are going. They, everyone, everyone, everyone in high school is going to be a millionaire one day. Just ask them. You know, so there's that mentality without them being presented all the opportunities available. So when they do get out of high school or go to college or whatever it may be, they now have multiple choices. Maybe they'll take a city test and a union test while going to college. Leave your options open. The days of the 30 or 40 year careers are not so much valid as they were a generation or two ago. Unless you're in a union, unless you have a city job. People go from, they work from, from Goldman Sachs, then they'll go to another financial firm, from one bank to another. So there's, you know, there's, I would advise the, the Board of Ed, the mayor, the city council to put a program in place that lays out a vast array of opportunities so they could approach multiple avenues. So they have multiple choices when they get out of high school and or college. It shouldn't be very, it shouldn't be singular because if that singular choice, that effort doesn't work out, you're really stuck at that point. And then that's when you end up, and I'm not knocking it, but you end up being a waitress or something like that because you just got to keep a roof over your head. Okay. Career should be something that can be developed at a younger age and choice and opportunity is is the key there i believe and, and blue collar blue collar careers are real they are careers and and they should not be yes. overlooked uh, and so um you know ronnie we're coming up on our uh, at our hour so um i want to ask you is there anything else that you want to add to um you know to the class of 2020 and beyond about looking into unions Uh, I'd like to bring just something quickly up if I can. Sure. When developers complain that they can't afford to pay prevailing wage or a union worker, then they should stop taking money from the city and state in the form of tax grants, abate, tax abatements to the tune of billions and billions of ye a year that they get. Uh, as of two years ago, Hudson Yards, a 26 or $27 billion project, was in receipt of $5.6 billion of your money, Letitia, your money, George. 
They get that money and then they fought us on paying prevailing wage while unions negotiate project labor agreements to make us more enti enticing and available to do these projects. Uh, we're very flexible, we're well-trained, we invest in the market, we hire soldiers. We are the backbone of the middle class. There is a great divide between the 1% and beneath that and the connection is the union workers. And uh, as far as getting the market going, it's the big issue these days. You know what? Do it right, do it safely, but it has to be done. Stop setting dates. It's June 13th, it's July 1st. It's, no. Don't set a date. Tell people, hey, do this and you're good to go. Yeah. I have a lot of confidence that small businesses, I know in my industry, they're doing it because they want, who doesn't want to go to work? Who doesn't want to open their business? Who doesn't want to make a profit? Of course they do. And they're going to do what it takes, just like they did when they opened the business. They're going to fight. They're going to utilize that American spirit that we were all born with to some degree. And we will prevail. Government has to do their thing. Make sure things are safe. Have a lot of oversight, but don't get in the way. Great, great ending, Ronnie. Rant. Great. I love your <laughs> rants. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close out, but I want to just remind you that on Friday, we're here at 2 o'clock with Catherine Paradiso, former commissioner for people with disabilities and a nurse uh, who is currently uh, teaching at the College of Staten Island. She's going to talk to us a little bit about this coronavirus and about nurses and nursing and uh, also, um, you know, people with disability and how they're moving forward in the <laughs> pandemic. So thank you, Ron, Loria, local uh, 28 Steelworkers uh, Union, George Passarello, my partner in crime, and my producer, and I'm Leticia Romero. And thanks, Mom. I saw you were watching. Bye, all. Bye, guys. Thank you.